I sat in a daze in the corridor, watching the cleaner, his cleaning machine swishing up and down across the floor. I sat and suddenly my daze was interrupted by two people walking towards me, dressed in scrub suits. Oh great, I thought, they're coming to give me an update. But as I walked closer, I could see their faces sullen, their heads down. They walked towards me and sat down beside me and introduced themselves. One a nurse and the other a critical care consultant. The nurse took my hand and the consultant spoke. This was to be the beginning of a life-changing situation, a huge curveball for me and my family. On the 12th of February last year, I took my daughter Rachel to the emergency department at our local hospital. She'd had a bug-like illness that week, nothing that was new to Rachel. She had been born with a condition called Noonan syndrome and she had associated heart defects, so she was susceptible to infection and caught infections very easily. So this time it was nothing unremarkable and her father and I treated it as we did any other infection with an antibiotic and lots of TLC. I am a nurse and I was initially at work that day on the 12th of February. And in my afternoon break, I decided to take, to take a bit of time out, phone Rachel's dad and see how she was responding. He said, there's not a lot of change, but when he said there's something really strange, he says, her hands and feet are freezing and her nails are a funny dark color. With her history, her cardiac history, I was immediately alarmed. So I asked permission to leave work and I drove to see her. She was pale, lethargic, and yes, what her father had said was confirmed. I drove her the short distance to the hospital myself. Rachel deteriorated quite quickly after our arrival and was taken into resus within minutes. With my background in critical care nursing, I knew Rachel was being treated with an urgency because I could hear the alarms sounding on the monitors she was attached to. So I sat across in that waiting room and my head spinning, I thought, gosh, when she gets home, you know, she's not going to get better anytime soon, she's really sick, I'm going to need leave, I'm, how much leave have I left, I need to speak to my manager, all these thoughts going through my head. Three hours after admission to hospital, Rachel was transferred to the critical care unit. I accompanied her there along with the medical team and as she went in through the door, I bent over, hugged her and I said, we'll see you very soon once I get you settled in. Dad's on his way and we're going to stay with you. Love you, darling. See you soon. I went and I sat in that corridor and I was worried and scared. Little girl. But as a glass half full person, I thought, she's going to be okay. This is going to be fine. Rachel's dad arrived and we were led into the, another room in the critical care unit. We learnt that Rachel had suffered a cardiac arrest shortly after arrival in the unit and that her life hung in the balance. We sat there speechless, numb, unable to compute the information we'd been given. Then time passed and another consultant came into the room with a glimmer of hope and told us that after 40 minutes of active resuscitation, they had managed to get Rachel back, but she was now on life support. We were told she was being treated for sepsis and was going into multi-organ failure rapidly and that the next 24 hours were critical. From that moment on, Harry, her older brother who lives away, was with us in the room on FaceTime. So through the night, we sat with Rachel and we watched the team work tirelessly around us. But at 10 minutes to four, on Saturday the 13th of February, 
24 hours almost to the minute from admission to hospital. Rachel lost her fight. She was 27 years old. Losing a child is the wrong way around. We should never let our children leave this earth before us. But here we were, a family faced with an incredible situation. The loss of a beautiful daughter, sister, niece, cousin, friend. We were devastated. A family in turmoil, hearts broken, dreams shattered, plans ruined. And for me, as a mother, where did I even begin to process what had happened? I have worked in a nursing career for 40 years, and I have seen many situations and grieved many situations. But losing Rachel catapulted any grief I held in those situations to another level. Now, I am no expert, but what I do know is that all of us at some stage of our lives will experience loss. What I would like to share with you today is my journey. 16 months on, I am still in deep grief. How does one come to terms with losing a life that was carried, given birth to, nurtured, guided, and loved unconditionally for 27 years? And the straight answer is, you don't. There is no sugarcoating grief. There's no timeline, no blueprint, no one size fits all. The days following Rachel's death, the feeling of numbness, shock, disbelief were all consuming. I went through the motions of her funeral on autopilot, being comforted by close family and friends. But it was in the months that followed that I got into the business end of my grief. I returned to work six weeks following Rachel's death. I threw myself into it, thinking this is the best thing to do. I'm a nurse, I want to care for others. This will help me. I parked my grief, but underneath I was struggling. I wasn't eating or sleeping well. I had brain fog. I had constant nausea, muscle pain, and tremendous fatigue. And this continued for several months. And it was coming up to the first anniversary of Rachel's death. And I was reliving every moment of it on the run up to it. What was she doing? Who was she with? What was she wearing? What were she and I doing? It was torturing me. I was broken, lonely, and very, very vulnerable. Of course, I kept most of it under wraps. I didn't want to burden my family and friends. They had their own lives to get on with. So I plodded along, getting deeper and deeper into my grief. By January of this year, I was physically and mentally exhausted. As usual, I was going into work. And on one particular day, I was about 20 minutes into my normal work routine when something suddenly hit me. I don't know what it was, but that day was my turning point. I knew I needed to get home. I got into my car and I drove home. And to this day, I have no memory of that car journey home. My mind and body had completely shut down. My boss came later to see me and asked me to call my doctor. I said, absolutely, no way, no. They'll put me in a psychiatric unit because I actually thought I'm going crazy. Again, she asked me, and this time I made that call. The impossible call that I had been putting off for the best part of a year. My doctor was brilliant. She listened to me sympathetically, and she told me, no, Wendy, you're not going crazy. You're having a severe grief reaction. I was almost relieved, and she prescribed medication for a short period just to get me over this hurdle. I have discovered grief is exhausting and debilitating. It hurts physically, mentally, and emotionally. And there are various narratives on how grief impacts us. 
the huge train hurtling down the track at breakneck speed, the tidal wave sucking you under. A grief reaction can trigger at the most minute sight, sound or smell of something memorable, and that can completely change my day. I personally call my bad days horrible. And grief is an ongoing process, and you travel back and forth through the various stages of denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, depression, acceptance, I don't know, 16 months on, if I can ever accept Rachel's death. How she was so quickly taken from us at a point in her life where she was blossoming into a beautiful young lady. She led her life with quiet dignity and grace and despite her health challenges, let nothing get in her way. She worked hard, but she had to work hard, but got there. She loved children, and she was a child care leader. She was also a scout leader. She volunteered at her local football club. She was a shopaholic. Hoodies, pajamas, and purchases were her favorite purchases. And many a day, she ran up the stairs with the bags under her arms. Hi, Mum, be down in a minute. After being in town shopping with her lifelong friend, Maeve. She was living her best life. She was also a little sister. She worshipped and adored her older brother, Harry, who lives away and could never wait to see him when he was home on holiday. So following what I would describe as my cathartic moment in January, I made a conscious decision that yes, I needed to grieve. I wanted to grieve, but to somehow try and adapt to learn to grieve well. And it's not easy. And on my horrible days, I have to dig deep. But as time goes by, I am learning that it all boils down to self-care and trying to find balance. The body doesn't like imbalance, and this manifests itself physiologically and psychologically, hence the symptoms that I was experiencing. Adopting a mindset of self-care is hugely important, and it takes time to find the strength to shift that, to shift your mindset. And self-care is not being selfish. And self-care is not about making those trips to the spa, to the for having that manicure, that facial. Of course, those are all good too. But it's about carving out space and creating a framework for you to allow you to heal and deal with the impact and devastation of grief. Practicing self-care helps me navigate my way through this journey. And I do gentle activities. I affirm gratitudes. I practice mindfulness. I meditate. I read. I will listen to a podcast or I'll go for a short walk. It's all about being still and just say, times just breathing. And it's also OK to say no. So if I have an invitation and I am having a horrible day and I don't feel up to it, I just say, no, thank you, not today. I never say no because that is so final. By saying no, not today, it leaves the door open for future plans to be made. You don't get over or move on from grief. You make space for it. Making space to grieve well is enabling me to think and feel more positively about Rachel's life and her achievements despite her challenges. And rather than ask why, I turn it around to a positive and I think what and how. What she did in her short 27 years and how she never complained. It doesn't always work and I often consult her. Rachel, what would you do today in my situation, darling? And I can hear her say every time, just get on with it, Mum. It'll be OK. Grief has become part and parcel of my life, and I have become another version of myself. But by being kind to myself and creating that space, it is helping me heal. More importantly, it is giving Rachel the attention 
she so richly deserves. And with the help of an amazing family, friends and community network, I am very slowly but tentatively adapting to life without Rachel in the physical sense, but I know that spiritually Rachel will never leave my side. And I love that comfort. My message today is recognize grief for what it is. Life-changing, heartbreaking, impactful. And then use the tools that you have to put you in that journey of self-care and healing. It is a journey that has many bumps in the road, sometimes potholes, but it is a journey for life. And on closing, if I can take one piece of advice from my beautiful, life-loving Rachel, it is to keep going. I have huge shoes to fill, but Rachel, I am learning from the best. Thank you.